Big O Roy, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be sitting face to face across to you and uh, getting 21 minutes of your time. Uh, it is indeed an honor. Thank you so much uh, thank for you this honor. Me. Thank you very much. For over four decades, you've set the standards in hospitality. But you know, I want to hear it in your words. What does the Obroy Group really stand for? We try our utmost to excel in everything we do. At this stage, you know, I want to take that thought to a personal level. Is there an anecdote, uh, an experience that comes to mind that really drives home what Bicky Obroy, what the Obroy Group stand for? Well, we stand for good accommodation, excellent service, good food, all the things that people, our guests demand every day from us. You know, 10 years ago when you opened the Raj Vilas in Jaipur, you clearly took the whole game to a whole new level. Tell me, uh, clearly India had never seen a property like that before. What were you thinking of when you started on this journey of the Vilases? It was our desire to have, uh, well, as far as Raj Vilas was concerned, that was the first one, to have a hotel that was ranked among the best in the world. And it was ranked number one in the world for, I think, at least one year, if not two. Were there any skeptics at that stage, those who, for instance, doubted your strategy, doubted your ideas? <laughs> many, <laughs> many, both within the company and outside. And what did you say to them? You said, let's go along, let's see what happens. You know, I, you chose to build each villas from scratch. You could have actually taken any number of grand existing forts and palaces and housed the Vilas brand within those existing structures. I'm actually extremely curious to understand why did you choose to build them from scratch? What was the thinking there? Well, I've been, I've traveled around India, seen many forts, many palaces. Most of them are not, most of them are not suitable for conversion for various reasons. We do have a, a palace that we think can be converted. It's in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, we haven't started work on it because there's no water and so the, uh, we are waiting for the Madhya Pradesh government to lay a pipeline. I think that will make a good hotel. But most palaces or forts don't make good hotels. They, they can't be converted easily. So what does make a great hotel? A great hotel, excellent site. I think site is very important. Uh, good food, good accommodation, and of course, above all, good service. I've heard you say this before, and you, I'm going to bring it up today. Functionality is much more important than aesthetics, and this coming from a person who has a very high sense of aesthetics. Give us an example of when you've had to choose well, functionality I'm, over aesthetics, especially when those aesthetics were very dear to you. Well, in all humility, I'm, I, I'm very flattered that uh, people say I have, I have uh, a big aesthetic sense. I am fortunate, I notice a lot of things. But uh, functionality is important. For example, a motor car. You can have a beautiful car, but if it doesn't function, what good is it? It's the same with hotels, I think. I've heard so many people say this of you. They say nothing escapes your attention. If there's a small piece of cutlery that's changed, if there's a fabric that's changed, Bicky O'Broy will catch on to it. Now tell me, honestly speaking, how can you keep a track of every little detail in all of these properties around the world? Is it true? Well, I think I have a good eye for detail, but I think uh, it's exaggerated by people. <laughs> but it does, um, you do look out for the detail. It, you walk into one of your properties, what's the first thing that catches your attention? What's the first thing that you're looking out for? Well, I look out for how the staff are dressed, and, uh, for instance. I look at a shoe first of a staff member. It's a habit I have. Uh, I look at their uniforms. I look at the ashtrays when we used to smoke. Now we don't smoke anymore in hotels. The little things that matter, I think, uh, most people think that people don't notice little things. 
Our guests may not say anything, but they notice things. And that's what I tell our people. It's the little things that count. And what do you think? I'm trying to distill all of the things that you've said so far. What do you think has contributed to your success as a hotelier, as an ambassador for the industry, as a manager of people? What do you think has been special about um, your career? Passion. Passion for hotels. And passion for our guests. You had the advantage of learning the trade at home from your father. What's the single most important lesson that he passed on to you and one that you treasure? I think he always used to say that people are the most important thing. You can make a hotel out of gold, but if you don't have the right people, you'll never succeed. And he knew a lot of people. He, he knew people by name. Even he'd go into the kitchen and he told the even junior chefs' names. And he was the people's man. And he always taught me that people are the most important in a service industry, industry such as ours. That's a tall order in today's uh, scale of operations. To, do, to know the name of every single employee of the group, uh, <laughs> is that something you still set for yourself as a goal? Would you like to know everyone who works for you personally? No, that, uh, that's not possible. When my father was in business, the number of hotels we had were, were much fewer. So, uh, he knew more people than I know. I try and rec remember people's names. Uh, we have an advantage now, which my father didn't have. We have the name on the, on the uniform. <laughs> you know, your father said, um, I don't want to be the biggest, but the best. Has your career been an extension of that thought or have you tweaked it? Actually, my father said he wanted to be the biggest and the best. <laughs> and I've somehow, uh, he may not be happy if you he heard this, but I want to be the best, not the biggest. You would like to be the best, not, yeah, the, biggest. not the biggest. How do you describe yourself as a leader? Uh, as a professional. Is there one quality that perhaps terrifies employees of the Obroe group? I don't know if it terrifies them. I, I, I go to places where, we've, where our employees are working in hotels other than ours. In many places. I've just been to Dubai and it's incredible the number of people I met who'd worked for us. They, and they're always, uh, there's, when are you opening a hotel here? We want to come back. And that must be so fulfilling. But I'm going to ask you to think back over your career. There have been so many awards. There's been so much recognition, both of you and the group. But what to you has been the most fulfilling thing? And I mean to you personally, that one thing which you hold dearest in terms of what you've achieved. Well, a few, a few years ago, uh, three, of our, uh, three of our hotels were ranked in the, amongst the first... 10. That was very satisfying to me. There must have been a fair share of pain as well in these years. There is in everyone's career. What's been the most difficult moment for you professionally? I think the 26th of November. It was heartbreaking for me. What did you say to your staff when you met them? Well, I told them that they'd keep their jobs, that they'd get their salaries. And they were then very happy. Do you think it's going to be, there is the physical restoration of the property in Bombay, but the morale of the staff, uh, do you think that that is going to be a more delicate and challenging task for you? The morale of the staff was quite low after the attack. After we talked to them, not only me, but our other executives, they were reassured that their jobs would be secure, that they would get their salaries on time. And even those people who lost their lives, we took after their families. So I think that was very reassuring for them. How does a company, a group of people, its management, actually move on after an episode like that? 
I think that we have to forget it. That the terrorists wanted us to terrorize us. And I think the sooner we forget what has happened and go about our normal daily lives, the better. It may not be easy for some people. But I think that's the answer. In many ways, the period that we're in right now seems to be a trough, not just for uh, the economy as a whole, but for the hospitality industry as well. Now, in your 50 years, you've seen many hard times, many good times, many peaks, many troughs, many booms, many busts. And I want to draw upon your well of experience. Are we in a trough? What will it take to get out of it when it comes to hospitality, hotels in India? Well, we are in a trough. But we live in a cyclical world, and I think that things will turn out better, not, with, in, not too distant future. I'm very confident. And has there been any key learning in previous such uh, downturns? Oh, yes. That, that we could share with uh, all uh, those from the industry sitting well, here today? 1991, the Gulf, first Gulf War. Then the attack on New York. Uh, these have been trying periods for our industry. Uh, and I think we're going through a trying period now, but we'll get over it as we have done in the past. I sense this from many business leaders that I talk to. They seem to have withdrawn. They're not thinking about their big ideas, their big projects. It's about let's get through this day, this week, this month, this year, and then we'll think about those great plans for the future that we once had not so long ago. So it's almost like going into a shell. Is, is that wise for the hotel industry? I think it's, uh, it's uh, unwise for anybody to think like that. I think we have to look, look ahead. Of course, people predict. It doesn't, uh, one never knows when this downturn will change. But I'm an optimist at heart and whatever I've read tells me that we'll be out of this trough, as you called it, in the next 18 months. I want to step away from uh, the negative onto the positive and that is where do you see the next new transformatory idea for hotels in India, in this region, what's the next big idea? What's the next exciting chapter that the industry as a whole should look forward to, should gear up for? Well, if you talk about the Indian hotel industry, I don't think we've scratched the surface of the industry. Uh, I may be wrong in these figures, but I'm told that uh, Beijing, for instance, have more, has more hotel rooms than the whole of India. And there are many cities that have more hotel rooms in this country. So I think that there is an enormous future for this industry. We are 1.1 billion people, a growing economy. And I see a, a big future for this industry. Luxury, high-end. Um, I can say from my own experience that 10 years ago, we would have said, there's no market for that in India. Who's going to be um, sort of there to, to take those services on now. And 10 years later, we know that there is a high-end luxury market in India. The global traveler has India on their map. The profile of the Indian traveler is changing. Um, these two themes that have emerged in the last decade or so, do you see these themes consolidating India, becoming much more of a tourist destination for visitors from around the world? Well, there's so much to see in India. We Indians, have, most of us, haven't seen the country yet. Uh, I've traveled around the place, uh, about the country quite a bit. And people are sometimes surprised where I've been. But the problem has been infrastructure. Uh, we don't have the roads or the airports to get to. We have some beautiful places, Assam, Himachal. Uh, I was talking to a person this morning from... Kurk. Uh, I've been to Kurk. Not many people have. So we have fantastic places in this country to travel to. 
But again, I think as infrastructure improves, these places will come on their own. And I think tourism will increase exponentially. For the Oberoi Group, what's next? What's, uh, what's the big idea you're working on specifically within the Oberoi Group? Well, we have lots of ideas. We share ideas within the company. Uh, I think that the uh, Asian market, there's India, of course, China, Thailand, Indonesia. We have a lot to do. I don't think, as I said, we have industries done enough in all these markets. And the industry will continue to grow in these markets primarily. Any new geographies you'd like to add on? China. I think China is a great big market. And a lot of people want to travel to China. How close is that? Well, I haven't been to China yet, <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> Uh, but I will go soon. I went, I planned to go to China and then we had the uh, epidemic. So uh, then I cancelled my trip and I haven't had an opportunity to go, but I, I hope this year I'll go to China. And that could set uh, the wheels in motion for, for the overall group in China. You know, you've said this before and I'm going to quote it. Uh, to succeed you must have you must be in the right market, you must have the right property, you must have the right partner. Tell me, those are three very intimidating rights. Do you actually get them right all the time, all those three rights? Well, if you don't get them right, you shouldn't do the project. And have you had to do that, walk away yes, when those we rights... Walked away. We've walked away from many projects. All, all those three things are important. They're the three pillars on yeah. which yeah. success is based. You know, I ask purely uh, with uh, vested interest, being a resident of Delhi. Is the Delhi property, the Delhi Overoy, due for a facelift anytime soon? Well, we'll renovate it. Uh, the problem has been the business has been so good uh, that you lose a lot of revenue when you renovate a hotel which is very busy. Uh, we have plans to renovate it, but my I've always said that that site where our hotel is located is the best site in Delhi. And we should build a new hotel there. That's what I would like in time. When? I don't know. It's a tough one. Tough one, yes. What will uh, the guests do in the interim? So could there be another project uh, in Delhi, close by, that we could look, look out to as the interim arrangement till the new... Well, I'm not advertising, <laughs> but we're building a, a hotel in Gurgaon, in Oberoi. Uh, I think it'll be a very fine hotel. And I know it's far from your home. <laughs> it'll take but a lot of convincing. So, it shouldn't take too long to get there. And there will, be, there will be opportunities in New Delhi itself, I hope. But again, you have to get the right site. Site is most important. You have your colleagues from the industry here with us this afternoon and is there a, a thought, a message that you would like to share with them? Well, as I said earlier, don't be intimidated by what's happened. Uh, the financial crisis and for my friends in Bombay or in India, the terrorist attack we should think ahead and go ahead with our plans. You may s uh, slow them down a bit, but I see a great future ahead. Does the word retirement figure in your dictionary yet? Retirement? I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, I can't uh, see myself sitting on a beach. Uh, I like to work. I have a passion for it and I enjoy it. So I'll work as long as I can. Your son and nephew are in the business now. What do you think is going to be the single biggest challenge for future managers of the Oberoi Group? I think they have to see what the future traveller wants. Tastes are changing every day. People are cha changing. The habits are changing. And you have to, the biggest challenge is to see what they want tomorrow. 
and that will be the big challenge because hotels will change as they have changed over the years. So I think you have to start predicting what the future customer wants. Well, they have um, the managers at the Overoy Group have uh, your forward-looking eye to guide them through uh, those decisions. Biggie Obroy, thank you so much for sharing your life, your thoughts, your experiences, and your journey. Thank you very much.